Say hello, this is John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk. Um, not in the New York studio. We're doing this one from from home, as I say. Um, and sorry, no uh, no Regan this week. She, I was trying to get her to join me by phone, but because we were not being broadcast on the radio station in, in the studio in New York, um, she... She took the opportunity to put some put some hours in it uh, at her real job, um, but I, you know, being off for a couple of weeks in a row, I I hate not um, at least reaching out to those of you who follow us on on Facebook. So uh, so here we are. Um, this will be obviously we're streaming live on Facebook right now, and we're streaming on my website, which is uh, www.letstalknative.com. Um, we'll post this up as a podcast and we'll ultimately put this vi video up on our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. Uh, got a few things to talk about, but, but first let me, uh, um, take care of some business, I guess. We, um, we're not on the air in, on WBAI today because, uh, WBAI is in its, uh, in its fun drive and, uh, so they put a fun drive show on, uh, in, instead of my, my show, uh, we will be back next week. But since we are on Fun Drive, I still want people to to understand that if we get donations or or WBA or BAI buddies as they're called for in the name of the show, there is a greater chance that we won't be uh, preempted in in future Fun Drives. So, you know, the more that the listeners of this program contribute to the station, <clears throat> the less likely it is that uh, uh, yeah, that that will miss miss a. a, a Miss a miss a week or two um, uh, as it relates to you know th these fund drives. So anyway, so what I'm asking you to do is go to the fund drive or go to the pl the pledge line. I'm sorry, five one six six two zero three six zero two. Make sure because even though you're calling during my time slot, um, make sure that you let them know you're making a donation in the name of Let's Talk, because otherwise they'll think you're just making a donation in the name of whatever program is playing, <laughs> playing on, the, on the FM dial. So, um, again, 516-620-3602. Make, um, make a donation of any size, one-time donation, or you can become a BAI buddy. And, and again, I ask that you, that you do it in the name of um, – that, that you do it in the name of – of, uh, of let's talk so uh, um you can also do this online so you can go to uh give to wbai.org and uh, you can make a donation donation that way as well so uh and again uh greatly appreciate it all right so um a couple of things i want to talk about uh, first off not knowing in advance that uh, that bloomberg was going to self destruct in his uh, first appearance on the debate stage last night i really wanted people to understand that from a native perspective again even though i'm not going to vote in this election i don't consider these elections my elections they're your elections but but the the folks that you guys elect as your leaders impact us and when coming out of the gate, we know that a Donald Trump already has these racist tendencies towards, uh, um, you know, towards Native people. If we know that from the, from the get-go, then we, we, it's easy for us to say, look, we don't support that guy. I'm not going to do an endorsement for anybody, you know, either party, you know, either, none of that stuff. But I will openly speak out against the people that I think are problematic. Mike Bloomberg is one of those guys. So... Look, I know he took his beating over, you know, making women sign NDAs in his employment and uh, stop and frisk, um, you know, redlining, uh, you know, you know and, and some of the racist things he's done there. Um, I, 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 they didn't talk so much about how aggressive he was towards the Occupy Wall Street uh, um, uh, uh, movement. Um, and I damn sure know that one of the things that never makes the conversation was his, you know, his his outspoken rhetoric against Native people, and specifically against Native people who had carved out a niche within, uh, look, politically correct or not, within the tobacco industry. You know, we, um, we, we took advantage and and we marketed our regulatory advantage on, um on the things that we could sell without New York State tax on it, and that included tobacco, but it also includes motor fuel. But. Mike Bloomberg was was not just aggressive towards towards native people in the, in the New York area, but he was so bold as to make uh, make vile comments and racist comments about the Senecas, even even way back here in, in Seneca territory. He actually suggested that David Patterson, the non-elected 
and and look, I'm not condemning him for for, uh, for being blind, but but the fact that he's blind kind of is relevant to to the suggestion that he made. Mike Bloomberg suggested directly to to um, uh, to David Patterson again, governor of the state of New York at the time, that he put on a cowboy hat, arm himself with a shotgun. And wanted to see the visual of him standing on the New York State Thruway as it crossed the Seneca territory here. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the 80, I'm not talking about Interstate 87. I'm talking about Interstate 90 as it crosses through the Seneca territory, Seneca territory, a place where Senecas have made a stand, you know, in, in much the same way that blockades are happening today. that I'll talk about a little bit later on where Senecas have made a stand over taxation with, with the state. But he suggested that that David Patterson put on a cowboy hat, take up a shotgun, and stand on the throughway and tell the Senecas that he was the law of the land. That, that he was. You know, forget about the fact that the, that the throughway crosses Seneca territory. So this whole idea of trying to create this cowboy and Indian, you know, BS, uh, you know, and, and this is the guy who wanted to say that he was, you know, gun control, uh, Mr. Gun Control, but he's literally... And if it is literal, even if it's metaphoric, but the idea that he thought that, that that David Patterson needed to be the armed marshal of Seneca territory or sheriff or whatever you want to call it um, is just it's just bizarre. And and part of Bloomberg's aggression towards um, towards the native involvement in tobacco and his aggression towards tobacco in general directly impacted what ultimately would be, you know, in, and I know there's a lot of debate over this, but ultimately his aggression towards, uh, so, towards uh, untaxed cigarettes would, would, uh, would actually be a contributing factor to Eric Garner being uh, killed in Staten Island. I mean, I know that he wasn't selling cigarettes and at the time, and a lot of that stuff was, was BS, but that's the argument that the cops used. That was their justification for, uh, for taking him down in the first place. And that's directly related back to, to Mike Bloomberg and his, uh, you know, and his racism towards black people, his racism towards native people. Um, and, I, and I just think that it's so important that people understand this. You know, there are a lot of things that you can criticize Mike Bloomberg for, but, but I don't think everything gets put out on the table. And, and, I, and, and as a native person, understanding that we are very marginalized, we are, our numbers you know, are not significant, so we don't reach the level of, uh, of, of national discourse over the racism, at least not on the U.S. side. <laughs> we'll talk later about what's happening on the Canadian side. But we don't reach the level of discourse when when uh, when something racist gets said about a native person, and I and I just I just feel like it's on me to to, to bring this up now. Of course, I can't get past the whole idea that a certain segment of the Democratic Party is just ready to line up behind Mike Bloomberg as if it in order, in order to beat a you know an arrogant wealthy white man racist white man in the White House you need to have another arrogant wealthy racist white man uh, compete against them I mean, I've literally heard I've even heard some native people say this that it's going to take a rich man to beat a rich man well you know if that's the attitude you have you've already resigned yourself to the fact that the United States is an oligarchy you know you don't need me to say it you you've already accepted that but the other thing is keeping in mind that we can get into the debate on how much of a Democrat Bernie Sanders is, or, uh, but there's no question that, that Bloomberg's political career was, was, as a, was as a Republican. And, and of course, he can't run as a Republican because he, you know, he has some platform issues that, would, <laughs> that, that aren't going to work. You know, gun control, you know, abortion, even the environment stuff is, are, are not planks of the, of the Republican uh, platform, at least not, not the side that he's taken on, the, on this thing. But the, but the whole idea that, that somebody th thinks you have to have a Mike Bloomberg to beat a Donald Trump and, and, or, and, and the fact that he's rich is, is the biggest driving force. I mean, he, he is literally trying to buy the Democratic nomination. And again, I know he had a, 
a, a miserable failure in the in the debate last night. And you know, and I gotta admit, it was it was kind of comical to watch him squirm. And uh, but I again, as a as a native person who isn't gonna vote in the election. I just think that I've got to, I, I at least have to communicate to this listening audience and the New York listening audience and, 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 and the native listening audience as well, that he has a track record of racism that goes beyond just uh, stop and frisk, redlining. Uh, it, it goes well into, in, into some of the, you know, the real racist comments he made about, you know, the native people in Long Island and uh, those of us up, uh, um, you know, uh, in Seneca territory, Mohawk territory, you know, all of us. So I, I just think it's important that people, people understand this. And, you know, so I, I wanted to bring up that much about Bloomberg. So uh, we'll, we'll put that one behind us for now. Again, I want to remind people um, that WBAI is in a fund drive and uh, it is important that uh, people make a contribution in the name of the show. So perhaps we won't have as much uh, in the way of preemptions next time. So again, I want to give the number out, 516-620-3602. Uh, that's the number to call to make a donation. Um, and you can become a, a BAI buddy um, or make a one-time donation. It'd be greatly appreciated. Um, I do want to bring up something that's happening at the end of the month. And I'll, and I'll mention, or actually next week is the end of the month. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll mention it a couple of times uh, throughout, you know, throughout the show. Uh, Regan and I will be hosting... A, uh, a screening of Invasion. Now, Invasion is it's a short film. It's only about 20 minutes um, about the Wet'suwet'en uh, people and the conflict that they're having in British, well, with British Columbia and with Trans Canada, a uh, you know, an oil and gas company. Uh, and this is about a pipeline that they're trying to put through their territory. The the film is great because it shows that they've been resisting this for 10 years. Now, if you don't know what the Wet'suwet'en uh, conflict is over, I'm going to fill that in a little bit more as, as the show goes on. But I think uh, I, you know, this is an invitation for you to come and see a film, them putting their conflict in their own words. And then we may supplement the evening with a, a couple of other videos, and I'll talk about some of the things we, um, we may uh, have available uh, for, uh, for next week as well. And this is at the Brooklyn Commons, 388 Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. Um, we'll be doing this at 7 30 in the evening um it's my chance to introduce you to to regan live and uh with a crowd uh, so you can see my uh, my new co-host um regan is very active and she's very uh she's very much a part of not just the the activist community in new york but uh, as a native activist and and you'll 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 see that just by coming out next week we will uh, discuss what the the status of um, the conflict with the, not just the Wet'suwet'en territory, but the fact that so many t places um, have been doing acts of solidarity, including blocking railroad tracks, um, you know, train tracks, uh, highways, um, border crossings, um, you know, any number of uh, places. And, and, and I want to talk about that. I want, I'll, I want you to understand how, the how and the why and the impact. So we'll talk about that next week at this live event. And of course, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more um, uh, on this show. I will say that um, when we have conflicts with the United States or Canada, we always get hit with this idea that, well, you guys got to follow the rule of law. In fact, and I've talked about this before, I went to um, a an open you know, public event, I guess you want to call it, or a, a session um, at the State Department back in 2010 uh, to this, this during the Obama administration to have a conversation about, um, about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The, the Obama administration says, well, maybe we'll, cl we'll clean the slate and take a brand new look at this thing. Why? Because <laughs> when this thing was passed by the United Nations in 2007, four countries voted against it. The United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. They were the only four countries. Now, some countries abstained, but they were the only four countries that voted against this thing. So they, they took a very active position against there being a declaration that laid out a minimum standard for uh, for nation states um, in their treatment of uh, of an indigenous population that you know preexisted their their uh, colonization. So, you know, at at this hearing, I asked the question: <clears throat> Why did the what was the United States against? 
you know, why did they vote against it? And, and I got a couple of answers. One of the answers was that the United States was afraid that this UN drip, as they call it, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, Peoples, would, um, would rewrite or redefine international law as it uh, related to Indigenous people. Of course it didn't. It really just used language that was already in the Declaration of Human Rights and anti-racism uh, you know, conventions and that kind of stuff. So it really didn't. It did add some language, but uh, and, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but it also said they were afraid that this would be the, uh, the beginning of something that would interfere with their current remedy for conflict with Native people. And they kept saying this thing. They kept talking about this remedy. So finally, I asked, and, and this was, an, again, uh, um, th this event was held at the um, um, National Museum of the American Indian uh, in, in D.C. on the Capitol Mall in, in their auditorium. And I said, what is this remedy you're talking about? And so the representative from the White House says, well, we mean court. And I, and I bring this up because it's, it's relevant to what's happening up uh, on, you know, again, on the north side of the imaginary line that separates uh, Turtle Island. This idea that both the U.S. and Canada think that their court system is somehow a neutral platform or, or a neutral remedy for us to get a fair shake in the courts. Now, I'm not saying we don't get a couple of rulings that go our way every once in a while. <coughs> And, and we do. And on the Canadian side, in particular, things like land title, there's been some, some rather dramatic rulings. But here's the problem. The problem is it starts at a place where the assumption is, is that Canada or the United States have jurisdiction, that they have jurisdiction over um, our land, our land use, uh, and, and our people. And that's problematic. I mean, because, because if we're taking the position that 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 we pre that our existence, our free and independent existence, predates the U.S. and Canada, you know, or in Canada's place, the, the British Crown, if we if we take that position, how can the courts even deal with that? If if we're approaching a conflict as a as a people who predate their existence, so essentially a, a people who had sovereignty. Over their lands and over uh, and and their and they were a sovereign people all, already before they existed. How can U.S. or Canadian courts even you know even deal with that? Their courts are bound by their laws. Their laws can't uh, uh, reach outside of the jurisdictional controls of uh, of the U.S. or Canada. They can't address uh, issues of international sovereignty. That's not what the courts are for. The courts are to uh, to enforce and to interpret domestic laws, not international laws. And, and, and in fact, you know, uh, oftentimes if, if an international uh, law is brought up into a court, they say, well, we, we can't deal with that. Or a UN declaration or anything else. Oh, well, that's, that doesn't have any bearing in this court. So their courts are incapable of dealing with the people who are outside of their constitutional reach. And that's the position that many of us take. Now, I'm not saying there aren't plenty of... Native people who have both assimilated themselves and attempted to assimilate tribal governments into um, into in, into those you know um, tiers of uh, Canadian or U.S. federalism. There certainly are. The question is, are they legit? Because when you think about what federal recognition is on the on the U.S. side, it's it's recognition as a tribe, band, or nation of Indians subordinate to the laws of the United States. Well. There's nothing that makes that happen other than either acquiescence or assumption, which is kind of the same thing. So, I mean, this, this whole idea that, uh, you know, that, that they can you know, in, enforce this, this, uh, this subjugation, there's no place where they can say we, we signed a treaty. Or we had transferred our sovereignty. That's a, a concept that you know people can, became aware of because of Iraq and, and all. But there was no transfer of our sovereignty to the United States or, or to Canada. Even though they passed laws like the Indian Act on the Canadian side. And they tried to restructure all of the, the, the native governments. That doesn't mean, even if they created a band council under the Indian Act. That doesn't necessarily, from a native standpoint give that ban council authority over the people. I mean, that's what the Canadian government wants to, wants to say, but that's not necessarily the way it plays out on the ground. And it's, and it's the same thing on, on the U.S. side. Just because the federal government recognizes a, a tribal government 
doesn't necessarily mean that the people do. I mean, sometimes these recognition processes are not based on any referendum of any kind. There, there's, there's, there is rarely a case where you can see an overwhelming number of Native people who embrace um, a BIA or an Indian Act um, a, a recognized election. So, I mean, it, so it's, it's all kind of a myth. So I, I just think it's important that, that people understand a, a little of this, this context as we go forward. Now, I will say, in the case of uh, the, the Wet'suwet'en Territory, um, they had, had won some, some major rulings in the Canadian Supreme Court about things like land title. The problem is nobody defines what that means. So if you're Native and the courts, U.S. or Canadian courts, acknowledge that you have original title to your land, or, or, or absolute title, whatever, whatever the Canada or the United States considers that to mean. What does it mean? Does it mean that you have say over your land, or does it still mean that the in in the case of the United States or or in Canada that they can still have their way with your land? They can push pipelines through. They can do mining extractions. They can do all of these things. That's the question, and it's been an unsettled question for. Well, you know, since white people came to our territory. And even in this, this era of rule of law and justice and, 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 you know, countries like the United States and Canada, you know, trying to put themselves out on the world stage as these bastions of human rights, it's simply not true. It's, it's simply not true. They are really among the most racist and have among in, within their, their population some of the most racist people I'll take it back, not just their population, within their politics. Because the conservative governments in, in Canada and the United States, racism is part of the hallmark of their, uh, of their political ideology. And, and that sure played itself out. In, in fact, I'll, I'll post a link to, um, uh, to what took place two days ago in the House of Commons in Canada because they had a special session, an emergency session of, uh, for all intents and purposes um, uh, of, co of, of their parliament to address the, the Wet'suwet'en conflict, the, the resistance over the pipeline, and the, um, the blockades that have been happening all over the country. And I'm going to talk about more, more of that you know, in, in the next half hour. And, and I think it's important that people understand why these blockades happen. What are they, you know, not only what are their response to now, but what are their response to going back a couple of decades? And, and I think it's really important that people people understand that. But they had a special session of uh, um, in in the House of Commons, and some of the most racist stuff I mean that that you'll ever hear came from the uh, the conservatives uh, in in their in their House of Commons. I mean, you, you had a lot of what I thought was stroking that took place. Yes, the Prime Minister of Canada. I mean, think about this because we don't get this on the U.S. side, right? But there was there's an event you know, or a, a circumstance that uh, that became such a prominent issue on the Canadian side that they called a special session in the House of Commons where the Prime Minister of Canada, I realize it's not the same thing as the President of the United States, and this guy's not quite as dopey as the one, that, the, the President of the United States, but where the Prime Minister and all of the parties came in and gave speeches in front of the, the in, in the House of Commons to address this specific issue, or at least talk about it. I mean, I won't say that it was addressed, but it was it, the, their speeches were directed towards this issue. And look, like I said, I'll post the, the link up. It's you should check it out. I mean, you got to get get through the French, the stuff spoken in French, but uh, um, <coughs> because you realize what what's being said by some of these guys seems pretty like a pretty much pretty much a concession but not by the conservatives I mean, you literally listening to this andrew Shear, who is the conservative party leader um or opposition party leader as they call it uh, literally you know just just poked you know i, I don't know ridiculed those people who could who could um who took it upon themselves to do these blockades in solidarity of, uh, of the Wet'suwet'en. And he says, not everybody has a luxury of not going to work each day, you know, or, or going to classes or, or whatever. I mean, because let's face it, Native people can't, you know, they're unemployed. 
They don't have to go to work. So they got all the time in the world to go protest. That, that's what the implication was. Yeah, and, and of course, native people, we don't, they don't go to school, so they don't have to worry about missing classes. So this is the kind of stuff that, ca- that comes out of, you know, essentially, you know, the, the same mentality on the Canadian side with the conservatives that exist on the, on the U.S. side with guys like Donald Trump and his base. It's, it's pretty remarkable. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. Um, we'll go out on another, another two and I'll catch my breath here. And then I want to come back and I want to talk about where, what is the foundation of the, of these blockades? Who was responsible for them and why? And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we, when we come back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk. All right. Thanks for coming back. This is John Kane and this is Let's Talk. Um, absent Regan, uh, my new co-host. Uh, and, and again, we aren't on the radio uh, but we we are on Facebook Live, and we will uh, put the show out as a podcast and and a YouTube video. So um, uh, if you're catching us live, and you and again you can catch us on our website, which is uh, www.letstalknative.com. Uh, if you're not catching the audio live, perhaps you're catching us the live video on Facebook Live. Um, hey, I mentioned before that we do our, our we are doing an event at uh, next week. That's um, uh, that would be what the 27th? Yeah, uh, Thursday, the the 27th. At at the Brooklyn Commons, we are screening Invasion, and it is a, uh, a twenty-minute uh, film that was done on the uh, the stand that the Wet'suwet'en are taking um, against uh, Trans Canada, putting a gas line uh, through their territory, um, which is kind of where you know what what is you know basically escalated to. Uh, essentially RCMP going in and arresting a bunch of people and uh, and then a, a lot of sol- solidarity um, movements, actions uh, taken uh, to support them. Uh, we are going to do this. And I will say, and I did mention this earlier, it is a WBAI event. What we do is we put out a, uh, you know, a basket and we ask you to make a donation, uh, which, you know, which let's talk, we'll, we'll get credit for um, and we'll make a donation to, um, uh, uh, to WBAI. Um, I'll, I'll put out the basket so when you come, bring some cash, bring a check, you know, maybe some jewelry you don't want anymore. No, I'm only kidding. I'm not, we're not going to take jewelry, but, but no, uh, make a donation. We, we greatly appreciate it. So um, again, that's next week, uh, 7.30 p.m. At, you know, I'll do my show next week with, with Regan, and then we're going to stick around. We're going to do this event. Uh, we're not only going to show this video. We may pull out a, some, a couple other, uh, you know, video clips. Uh, so people are more well-informed, something that'll update beyond the, this 20 minute film that was produced. So that's what we'll, uh, that's what we'll, that's, that's what the plan is. So, um, all right. So, uh, you know, a couple of things, you know, I'm, I, I talked about this, uh, this house of commons, um, event that took place a couple of days ago and, and it was pretty remarkable. I mean, just, just listening to what, um, there was essentially, I guess five, Five people who gave some level of testimony. Um, there was the, the prime minister, the opposition leader, the uh, uh, the leader of the NDP or the what they call the Democratic Party, I guess. Um, uh, what's that? New, New Democratic Party. Yeah, and that was uh, um, uh, Jagmeet Singh. Uh, and 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 it's interesting because you know his comments were to me were a little bit better. And then there was a minister out of uh, British Columbia herself, I think, that uh, um, that spoke as, as well. And, and of course, there was one of the ministers from, from Quebec, and he only spoke in French. Um, but even his comments were, you know, of course, I'm, you know, I'm reading subtitles, so I, you know, I, 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 maybe I didn't follow everything. But um, I do encourage you, I will post the, the link up on, on Facebook, and you can, you can go to that. It's about 40 minutes. In fact, maybe what I'll try to do is, um, maybe we'll work on trimming the We'll trim all the French stuff out and, and put, uh, uh, you know, in some of the testimony that wasn't related to the issue. And maybe we'll, we'll recast the video or something. We'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, but, it, but it's worth a listen. But the other thing is even the people who, sp- who spoke somewhat favorably about Native people and, and, you know, again, the injustice, the historical injustice. None of them can wrap their heads around the, the very idea that Native people... On, you know, on the Canadian side or on the U.S. side, for that matter, that we aren't them. They, they still want to say, oh, we are all Canadians. We're all Canadians. We're all Americans. We're all this. They, they can't wrap their heads around the idea that there are Native people who still hang on to that free and independent existence in spite of, you know, the, the massive buildup of, uh, of, of the colonial powers of Canada or the United States. 
that, that we still exist. And, and I got to tell you, Native people are, are, are confused about this issue, too. You'll hear even people who stand will stand strongly as uh, as traditionals or on the on the Canadian side, some what they refer to as hereditary chiefs. You'll hear them call, call themselves Canadians, even though they're really trying to draw a line in the sand about their distinction. They still slip into that. And why? Because because of assimilation programs that are hundreds of years old, you know, even that the assimilation programs that are older than Canada. I mean, remember, Canada is a British colony, essentially. But these assimilation programs, this idea of trying to corrupt our, our minds um, from any of our traditional beliefs, you know, the idea of, of imposing and, and, and suggesting this male patriarchy, this male dominant societies that, that, that all came from Europe, the Christian male dominant societies that all came from Europe, the racism that all came from Europe. This is what we're inundated with. You know, and, and you know, Jake just made a comment um, during the break that if you, if you go to any of these sites, you look at any of the news coverage on the Canadian side, it is amazing the level of race, uh, uh, um, of racism that exists uh, on the uh, in Canada. And especially since so many people believe that um, that Canada is so nice, you know, and, and you know, and of course, you know, they have so, they have cheap cheap drugs there. <laughs> I, I mean pharmaceutical drugs. I don't. You know, yeah. I mean, got the other stuff too. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean the, the the impression that people think, oh yeah, Canadians are so nice. No, they aren't. There is racist and look, we have people. The whole missing and murdered Indigenous women thing is is born out of the racism that exists there. I mean that's that's just it is what it is i mean um, death by cop the, the the prison population it's all born out of uh, out of this 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 racism and you know, so anybody who, who thinks that that canada is nice well don't try going up there as, as a native person or a person of color i mean that, that's <laughs> i mean that's all i gotta say but but again part of the the, the biggest problem that that we face as native people is you know some of it's internal you know, some of the, you know some of us who who take a a stronger stance on our on our free and independent, our distinction, our our existence as 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 a people who are not Americans, who are not U.S. citizens or Canadian citizens. We have we 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 have some of that battle within our own territories, but we also we sure have that sure have that battle against the, the views that Canadians and uh, and and U.S. officials have, and this is a place where they just can't. They can't wrap their heads around it. I mean, even though there is no legal place, there, there's no event, there's no treaty, there's no um, <clears throat> surrender or, like I said, transfer of sovereignty. There's nothing that the, the U.S. or Canada can say, okay, this is when you all became ours. I mean, the United States passed the Indian Citizenship Act in 1924, but we didn't ask for that. I mean, maybe some people did. <laughs> Maybe some people, some Native people want to become U.S. citizens because they thought that we, that would be a better circumstance than, than what we were existing as in 1920 and in, in, in 1924. But there was no broad-based, you know, million-dollar campaign for us to, you know, to, to line up at, um, you know, you know, as, as, as some sort of twisted idea of an immigrant to become a U.S. citizen or some naturalization office. No. And in fact, they never even created a process. They just said, well, well we're going to declare that you're all citizens. Well, wait a minute. What if we don't want that? And we don't. And in fact, and, I, and I've mentioned this on several shows before, the act of uh, this making, having a sweeping law that, that essentially strips a people of their national character and imposes another national character upon them, in 1924, that was considered a, a war crime in Europe or, or in the international community, but the United States didn't care. Well, we, we, we can't commit a war crime against Native people. You know, us granting our – us imposing our citizenship is, is, is a benefit to them. See, that's the whole idea of racism, right? When you look at a people and say, nah, they're, you know, they're beneath us and we'll just lift them up. We're not, not going to lift them up to our level. I mean, <laughs> let's be clear. Even though in 1924, when they passed the, the Indian Citizenship Act, Native people who, who accepted it still weren't allowed to vote. They, Native people, for the most part, weren't, weren't able to vote until the 1960s. I mean, most. 
I mean, most that want it to anyway. So, I mean, this idea of citizenship, yeah, it's not what you, what you think it is. But this is something that, the, that these guys have a hard time wrapping their heads around. Now, I did want to explain these blockades. Who's responsible for them? I'll tell you who's, who's primarily. I mean, right at, at, in Wet'suwet'en territory, it's the Wet'suwet'en people who, who have um, denied access of, the, of these pipeline builders, TransCanada. And, 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 and it's not just there. There are other places where, where Native people are saying, no, we don't want pipelines through here. Or at very least, they're saying, we don't want that pipeline. That pipeline's not, it's, it's, it's too big. It goes through some of our more sensitive lands. I mean, honestly, I think Native people are, are given oftentimes way too many concessions on these pipelines. And part of it is they got this promise of jobs. And so, you know, that they're going to somehow benefit from them. this pipeline that is, that is being, you know, attempted being built through wet soil in territory isn't providing natural gas to, to any domestic consumers or native consumers. No, this gas line is about going out to the coastline so Canada can sell, out their sell off their natural gas to, to China. That, that's the whole thing. This, this pipeline is not about energy independence or you know, a cleaner environment for, for Canada. Like hell. For one thing, the, the environmental degradation associated with, uh, with extracting natural gas, I mean, fracking and the whole bit, uh, ha has its own problems. But if, if you're trying to convince people, I mean, look, I'll concede, burning coal is dirtier than burning natural gas. But if you're going to just say, oh, don't worry, we, we've got a, um, a, a, essentially a never-ending supply of natural gas so you can keep burning fossil fuels, it still creates CO2 emissions. And natural gas, not, not just the extraction of it, but the distribution of it and, and all of it, there is one of the biggest uh, greenhouse gases there are. I mean, part of the natural gas industry is oftentimes, in many ways, worse for the environment because it just leaks into the atmosphere and 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 man is doing that i mean this this stuff is sequestered you know deep in the ground until until man pulls it out and and they do it in in among the dirtiest ways possible but again this natural gas is not for domestic consumption it is going out, it's going out to the uh, to be sold in in, in asia in, into china but anyway let me let me get back to, to who's so who's doing this I'll tell you who's doing it. Not only are the people standing up for, uh, against these pipelines, but the solidarity action, the blockades that, that are really, by some estimates, have crippled Canada's economy, it's Mohawks. It, 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 it's the people that I know. It, it's, it's Mohawk people, Gunyogahaga people from uh, a, a several native Mohawk communities, Gunawage. Uh, Six Nations, um, uh, Sadagi, but the biggest blockade has been through a, a really one of the smaller Native communities in, in Tandanega. And that blockade basically has, is stopping rail from going from, from Toronto to Montreal. So that's a, it's a major thoroughfare. So why did why the Mohawks step up, up in the way they did? Well, I'll tell you one reason. One reason is because going back to 1990, when when we were facing a major um, uh, hostilities from the Canadian government in terms of what people regard as Oka, but Gunasadaga, a native community where the, the village of Oka, non-native village of Oka, wanted to expand a golf course onto our lands, it turned into a major, major debacle where they came in with uh, their, their Quebec police force, their, their SQ as they called them, um, and you know, they fired upon our people. Our people fired back. One SQ uh, um, police officer was killed in all likelihood by their own people, but friendly fire. But it turned into this major conflict, and uh, you know where people were, 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 where there was a standoff that went on for you know for like a hundred and fifteen, hundred twenty days or something like that. But during that time. There were territories all across Canada who, in acts of solidarity for, for, the, for us, for the Mohawks, had taken some action. They blocked rail lanes, railways. They, they, they actually even toppled some power lines. And some of that support came all the way out from, from, uh, from B.C., from the native peoples whose territories are, are within the, uh, the province of B.C. So part of what, what drove so many Mohawks to take this action was reciprocating, 
was was giving back to the Wet'suwet'en people who stood with the uh, with Mohawk people during the Oka crisis of 1990. So part of it was that, but part of it is just doing the right thing. And one of the best ways to to stop pe- uh, a slaughter of people and to stop that kind of aggression is to incur a cost on the Canadian government. So these blockades, they did, they were really effective. I mentioned this this uh, House of Commons uh, emergency meeting. It was done mostly because there were people screaming bloody murder about these uh, about about the Mohawks primarily, <laughs> but others as well about the Mohawks um, stopping, you know, cutting down their uh, their economy, stopping the railways. And again, highways, including including border crossings. Seneca's here went out to the Peace Bridge, uh, the Thousand Island Bridge, which is you know isn't necessarily a native occupied land anyway. It's all native land as far as I'm concerned. But um, no, so so people stepped up all over, but uh, primarily on the on the on the Canadian side. Again, the border crossings usually had people on on, on both sides involved. But um, this, I mean, this measure of solidarity really took um, took Canada by surprise. And, and of course, I've mentioned this before, but one of the issues um, that the Canada was keenly aware of during, um, especially when the Idle No More movement first, uh, you know, kind of ratcheted it up, was that how much of their infrastructure was was vulnerable to what could be characterized as a native insurgency. And why is that? Well, because they they huddled most of our ter- our peoples into these crappy little villages that where our people lived in, in in abject poverty even though we still had you know major holdings i guess for lack of a better word of, of land so as they moved us you know out of the woods so to speak and put us into these these, these crappy little villages they looked at, at our lands as, as something that they could just cut through that they could do mineral extraction, they could do logging, they could run pipelines through. So they looked at our lands as something that they had unfettered access to, even though legally, none of that is clear. And and it's certainly, it's not even clear in their own legal system. But as far as we're concerned, eh, that's pretty clear. No, you don't have any right to, to do these things on our lands. So... That infrastructure, including some of these rail lines, I mean, in, in Tandanega, they basically blocked a railway that goes through Tandanega. And, and many, much of the Canadian infrastructure, highways, power lines, pipelines, uh, rail lines, they didn't care that they were cutting through native territories. And it's only been, you know, in the last, you know, dozen years or so, you know, or 20 years, where we are getting more attention to our resistance to this stuff. I'm not saying we didn't resist. I mean, look, we, in Gunawage, there was, there was fights over the seaway. There was all kinds of stuff that, that, that had been fought for, you know, for decades, you know, or longer, many, many decades. But we started getting a voice, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. So now our resistance and the resistance that's, that's laid out in this film, Invasion, you know, kind of shows people, no, we have, the, we have the right to do this. We have the right to fight, you know, to fight uh, invasion of our territories. We didn't always do it. And that's how these railways got there in the first place. In a way, we gained leverage by letting them go through our territory because now when we shut that, uh, shut that access down, it puts Canada in, in a tough situation. And so that's, what, that's what's transpired over the last two weeks now. It's, it's really been two weeks that um, that other places, you know, uh, in, in, including Mohawk uh, Mohawk people, started really stepping up uh, in, in with these acts of solidarity. Now, the fight in Wet'suwet'en territory has been going on for ten years. The Unistoden camp and some of these things, and of course, fights other places. Look, this is a parallel to what transpired with the um, uh, with the, the Dakota Access Pipeline. But the difference is on the on the other side of that imaginary line. Our people have a little bit more logic and they realize that you don't all have to go pile into, you know, some remote territory that doesn't really have the resources to support 10,000 people showing up like in Standing Rock. You can do the you, you can take actions within your own communities. And, and, you know, this is this was always the wiser choice. And in fact, even for us, I mean, as Haudenosaunee. When we were battling New York State over over tax issues, we didn't all feel like we had to go to Seneca territory or Mohawk territory. 
We all did things within within our own communities to, uh, you know, or either we did things or we certainly threatened to, uh, to do things. And that gave us more power. But if you if you just all pile in, if, you know, five, eight, ten thousand of you just go someplace. Now you're like fish in a barrel. All those ten thousand people who showed up at uh, at Standing Rock, man, if that same ten thousand people were spread out in their own native territories and took a stand against against the United States, you know, or against North Dakota and, and the extractive industries, that would have been a much more effective fight. And that's what you know what our what our folks did here with the with this uh, with the Northern, uh, conflict. Our people didn't all rush out to uh you know to Unistodan camp or to uh, uh what's over in territory they they took the appropriate actions and, and of course so what what's what are those appropriate actions well the conservatives all want to say oh they were illegal they're all just a bunch of radicals terrorists i mean they stopped short of saying the word terrorist but eh, it was it was kind of loaded in, in their in their commentary so they want to, and and so then you get this Andrew Shear, the you know this you know Trump like figure on the Canadian side, basically saying that we were you know the, the only ones who um, who were causing the problem were a few very small minority of radicals, oftentimes, and he even described it as people who weren't even connected to native territory. I mean, making it sound like it, I don't know who the hell the things these people are. Sure, there were some non native people who have stepped up, allies as we call them. Even some young people, high school kids, because there are, look, as much racism exists in Canada, just like on the U.S. side, we have people who who, who understand and who do see our, our view and, and who do support what we're doing. And and many of those supporters came out to these uh, to these blockades. So it wasn't just native people, just primarily native people. And these blockades were orchestrated by native people. But we had we had white allies there as well. So. You listen to the to this you know the, this opposition party, this conservative party leader, literally just trying to say that you know make the case. Oh yeah, most uh, most people want these gas lines. They want the jobs. They want the opportunities. And of course, that's just you know categorically bullshit. I mean, there, there's no there's no way that if you if you poll native people who have who have already suffered, you know many of the big dam projects the hydro quebec you know displaced millions of you know of acres of land um you know killed you know uh, uh, tens of thousands of caribou displaced native people in in their traditional ways of life their sustainable ways of life uh the the people who have been uh, you know had been devastated by these these extractive industries these logging industries Canada's uns insatiable appetite for uh, for for stripping wealth out of the land has always come at the expense of native people. So whether it was flooding out native territories for the hydropower and, and, and who would they sell the hydropower to? I mean, it wasn't even all, again, what, even back then it wasn't for domestic use. They were selling it to the United States, the other energy uh, uh, pigs of the world. So this is, is a history of, of, of exploitation of native people, and native lands. One where even when they, they, they clearly know that these lands are ours, you know, just, just like the United States, just like Kinzua Dam Project in, in Seneca Territory. There was no question that, uh, that you know, that, the, that there was Seneca land that, was, that would be flooded by, by putting up a dam to, to protect Pittsburgh from flooding. But they, they just didn't, didn't care. Now they care a little bit more. Why? Because not only can we make, when, when they drag us into their courts, they can't even beat us in their own courts in, in, many, in many cases. And, and you know, we've, we've got international support through the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And any of these human rights, you know, uh, conventions that take place in the UN or, 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 or that any of these, these countries invo are involved in put them in a tough spot. And so we are empowered a little bit more. We have the we have the world of communication at our at our fingertips with 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 cell phones and with you know um, the internet and uh, live streaming and all that stuff. So so we can cry foul and, and and actually get some people to hear it and see it. We get we can display the violence that our people are are suffering. For decades we couldn't.
And that's the reason we have missing and murdered indigenous women and, and death by cop and, uh, and, and, and a disproportionate prison population uh, with our people involved is, is because this has all been covered up. Hell, hell, back in 1990, when the Oka crisis took place, there was literally a media blackout. They never even covered it in the United States. And in fact, in fact, some of what I'm talking about here on my what is normally my New York show, most of you don't have no idea that, that we forced an emergency session of the, uh, in the House of Commons in Canada, where the Prime Minister was the had to address the House of Commons. You have no idea. If I'm not telling you this, I mean, yeah, maybe WBA. I, I, actually, it's funny. As I'm doing this show, I realize that uh, Paul D. Rienzo from, uh, from WBI is trying to call me to, uh, to, to put me on the air on WBI. Well, they probably shouldn't have preempted me, I guess, if you want to be on the, on the air on WBAI. I'm still on the air. I'm just doing it through Facebook. But no, we, we have the luxury of, of getting some of this news out. But it's, it, it's not without challenges. Again, hardly anybody on the U.S. side is aware of what's taking place on the Canadian side. And, it's, and it's, it's not just relevant. It's the same thing. It's the same thing that took place with Standing Rock. You know, I, I have some people say, well, yeah, but you got to really understand there's a big difference between Canadian law and U.S. law. No, there isn't. <laughs> no, there isn't. You know, the doctrine of Christian discovery, this, you know, uh, this race-based doctrine lies at the legal foundation for the u.s and canada to make their claims not only about land land title land use but about domination over us as a people i mean that's that's what lies at the foundation of this stuff so i i think it's it's really important that people people don't just try to compartmentalize the abuse that native people in Australia go through or in South America or in, you know, in the United States or in, uh, on the Canadian side, it's all the same thing. And, and it's real easy to look at something that's happening someplace else and, and, and see the atrocities in it, especially if those atrocities may seem more egregious because, you know, maybe they're a bloodier conflict or, you know, so when we, when we hear the word genocide, we don't if, if 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 we can't connect it to a bloodbath, it's like it doesn't count. Well, it does count because genocide isn't just about killing people; it's creating the conditions where a people cease to exist as a people. That's what I mean. Canada's absolute refusal to acknowledge that we are distinct from them. The United States' absolute refusal to acknowledge that we are distinct from them—that is part of that's still genocide. That's still forced assimilation. One of the articles right in, in the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People says uh, it, it is a violation to, to, to forcefully assimilate people. And, I, and I've talked about it on this show many times, but even the, the very act of creating our own travel documents, when the United States and Canada says, look, if you want to cross even the U.S.-Canadian border or travel anyplace else, you have to... You have to declare your citizenship to the United States and Canada and travel on their passports as U.S. or Canadian citizens. All that indigenous stuff. I mean, you know what they called the Haudenosaunee passport? They, they, they called them fake, fraudulent documents. I mean, that's literally what, what Canada and the United States have done. Even though we, we tried to follow international protocols and in, in, uh, in creating our own travel documents, but the whole world, you know, even even all the nations that voted for this in the first time time around, still can't wrap their heads around native people um, representing ourselves uh, with our own distinct identity, our own distinct travel documents, and and the fact that we reject the notion of being um, corralled and subjugated by the United States or Canada. Uh, hey, we're at the top of the hour, so uh, we'll uh, we'll take a bit of a break, and uh, we'll come back with well, well, we'll come back with some more. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk. All right, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane, and this is Let's Talk. Um, kind of a, a special edition of Let's Talk because we aren't broadcasting on WBAI. Um, we are just doing this on Facebook Live. Uh, I will be back in the New York studios, in the WBAI studios, next week um, with with Regan. Uh, we also are doing an event after the show, uh, 7.30 p.m. Uh, in, in the Commons downstairs in the, ca in the cafe media room. Uh, so 
come on out. We, uh, much of what I'm talking about today, uh, we will also be talking about uh, during that event. Now, this is a kind of a fluid situation. There's a, there's a lot happening. In fact, I'll, I'll again, I'll continue to update <laughs> what, what's happening today at, versus even yesterday and the day before. Um, to, to kind of put this stuff in, into its into its proper context. Um, but by next week, you know, we don't know what the story will be. So uh, so there'll be, there'll be more to talk about uh, at the event next week as well. So <clears throat> again, we're going to be showing uh, the film Invasion, which is it shows the, the 10 year resistance that's been taking place um, in uh, Wet'suwet'en territory. And it's not even just resistance. I mean, what the film kind of shows is that some of these people said, you know what, we're not going to live this destitute life in these Canadian, you know, um, built up villages, you know, uh, in, in, a, in just a, a small portion of our territory. No, we're going back out into the bush, as they say. And we're going to go to to our pristine lands, and we're going to build cabins, and we're going to and, and we're going to bring the people back in back to a more sustainable life. And, and that's what many of them did. And so not only are they resisting a pipeline and, and resisting this, this invasion of their lands, but they're saying, no, it's ours and we're going to use it. And, and, and I don't mean ab abuse it. I, and I don't mean exploit it the way, you know, a pipeline or extractive industries will. No, they just said, no, we're, we're living here. We're, we're, we're creating our lives. We're, we're, we are returning back to a more sustain, to, to more sustainable living. And that's what these guys have been doing. And that's what the film will show. So that's what we're going to do next week, uh, 7.30 p.m. Uh, we'll be showing Invasion at the Brooklyn Commons, 388 and Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. Um, uh, come out and I'd like to introduce you to my new co-host, Regan. And uh, it's a bit of a, a fundraiser for, for WBAI, so we will put out a, a donation basket. I mean, the last film, we, we I think we raised $250. Bucks, um, that, and here's what I do with that, just so you know. <laughs> for anybody who's concerned about you know what happens when money gets donated well in this particular instance since since the commons is um is the building that houses the wbai studios what i do with when when um the owner of the of the property gives me the uh, uh makes it available for me to do these events the money i raise i actually give to her and she assigns it she she credits it against wbai's rent in the building so so it goes directly to a wbai bill it's just a it's just that I, I make the decision what it, <laughs> where it goes, I guess, by giving it to uh, to Melissa at the Bro Broken Commons. So just just so you know. Um, anyway, so so that's what that's what we have planned for for next week. We'll be back in the studio. We'll be back on WBAI, and of course, we will be in the comments. All right. So what's transpired? What, first off, when if you do get a chance to check out this video uh, of the House of Commons, it's incredible to watch. It, 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 <laughs> Just how disrespectful it is. I mean, even while Justin Trudeau is speaking, and I, look, I'm not a huge Trudeau fan. Don't don't get me wrong, but to listen to the to the heckling and the chatter and the noise and and I mean, these are supposed to be the sophisticated, you know, uh, parliamentarians. I mean, it's 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 insane to to watch his behavior. And of course, I know you've seen people throwing shoes and stuff like that in in you know in some of these other countries when they when they hold their parliaments. You talk about. I don't know, not just not just childish behavior, but just, I mean, these are supposed to be the sophisticated, you know, civilized people. But anyway, so not only do you do you get to hear um, several perspectives: the prime minister, the opposition leader, the the NDP, the uh, the folks from Quebec and from British Columbia. Um, you get to hear all of what they had to say. Um, but but when you get a chance to, to hear it you'll realize how much tension exists. And, and of course, you know, the, the loudest group are the conservatives, conservatives, of course. They're always the ones who make the most noise. They're the squeakiest wheel, right? And they're the ones who are, are calling for, for action. You got to go in there. You got to arrest these people. You got to send the police in. You got you to drag those people out of there. They can't block. What they're doing is an illegal act. And, you know, and the rest are saying, look, <laughs> Maybe blocking a rail may not be a legal thing to do, but it's a pretty civilized thing to do in terms of uh, in, in terms of asserting your your opposition and resisting. And you know, so the, it's just interesting to watch how how this played out. Now, again, just to be clear, the reason this 
happened and and the blockades happened wasn't just over the 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 um the people of Wet'suwet'en territory blocking access you know to, for these pipeline builders it was the decision to send in the RCMP the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and these you know these aren't just guys with red coats on horses I mean they're still called the RCMP but they aren't they, they aren't these you know little wooden soldiers on horseback yeah these are this is a paramilitary um, police force, a, a federal police force. And they went in with automatic weapons and, you know, and, and, and the whole nine, you know, the whole nine yards. I mean, they, they went in there as an aggressive force, uh, arrested, um, you know, assaulted some people along the way. And it was, it was the RCMP going into Wet'suwet'en territory that said, all right, that's it. We're, we're not going to, we're not going to stand back and let this happen. That's when these blockades went up. So when, when, you know, the folks in Tindanega and, and other Mohawk communities said, we're, we're going to take this action in solidarity. It, to be clear, the reason for blocking the, the, the highways and the, and the railways was to say, get the RCMP out of there. And, but so even after this House of Commons thing goes on and, and you hear all of this, this, you know, this rhetoric being spewed, the interesting thing was, you know, yesterday and, and into today, <clears throat> we're hearing overtures that while the RCMP is willing to leave the Wet'suwet'en territory, but, <laughs> and of course, there's always a but, right? They said, yeah, we're willing to leave as long as uh, the, the pipeline workers uh, can, can get access to do their work. Well, what the freak are you talking about? Why do you think this is going on in the first place? I mean, you, so you, the RCMP, you're saying you'll clear out of there? If what, everybody just lays down for you? The reason you're there is because the people are blocking access to, the, to building this pipeline. It's because the people are opposed to it. So when you making some, you know, you say, well, this is, this is our um, a good faith gesture. This is our, our olive branch we're offering. We'll pull out as long as you let the workers continue to, to, to screw up your land. No, that's not going to happen. And, and of course, you know, as I'm watching some of the videos and some of the clips that are, they're making, you know, that are coming from news all over Canada, you've, you've got these, the, these traditional chiefs, what they, what they call hereditary chiefs. And I don't, I don't fully wrap my head around that, but these traditional chiefs saying, look, you can't negotiate with us by putting a gun to our head and we won't do it. And, you know, and of course I, I hear the news broadcasts are saying, well, um, what do you need to, uh, you know, to, to uh, grant access to the, to the pipelines and 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 so these these older guys these, these again these traditional guys are saying we're not this is an immediate event i can't speak for not only the rest of the uh, of the of, of our council but for our people that's a decision we have to make collectively and thus far the the decision we made collectively is that we oppose this pipeline <clears throat> which is why the police are there so when the police say, okay, well, if you let the pipeline go through, we'll pull out. Of course you'll, you'll pull out if we let the pipeline go through. I mean, it's like, are, is this kind of some sort of bizarre world that people don't even understand what the, what the resistance is over? So, I mean, when, when you hear people, well, the RCMP, they're willing to pull out, you know, it's, now the ball's in the court of the native people. No, <laughs> it isn't. Here's it isn't just about, the reason the blockades are happening is because the RC, RCMP went in there and violated these people. But the reason the RCMP were violated these people is because the people don't want the pipeline. That's the first violation. So here's the condition. The condition is RCMP pull out and, and pull your pipeline people out. And then the blockades come off and, and the conflict is over. Well, but we can't allow native people to, to stop Canada from doing their big projects. <laughs> well, if you're going to do it on their land, you can. And, and in fact, we're saying you must. I mean, look, the, even though this is almost, again, uh, the same kind of media blackout that took place during the Oka crisis, there are people all around the world who are seeing this. It's just that, you know, Americans are consumed with their, with their Donald Trump, you know, so they don't know what that, what's happening in the rest of the world, even if that rest of the world is only a couple hundred miles up, uh, above the border or a hundred miles above the border. I mean, this, this is how narrow and, and, and Americentric, uh, I guess, uh, um, uh, Americans are. I mean, they, can't, they can't, can't barely see past their nose. But this is an issue. And, and again, I can't downplay 
the significance of us taking a strong enough stand as Native people across the entire, you know, all of Canada for, uh, for all intents and purposes, taking a strong enough stand to force the Prime Minister and all of these other you know, parliamentarians to come together, to, you know, to, to throw their barbs at each other. I mean, we literally caused, you know, caused a ruckus at the, in the Canadian House of Commons. Uh, now, I'm not saying that there's a solution here because the, you know, thus far, the Canadian politicians are saying, well, we're not going to call, we're, we're not going to have the government pull the RCMP out. Well, who the hell else is going to? They make it sound like the RCMP has a will of its own. That they can do whatever they want to do. That that somehow nobody has any control over to tell them what they should or shouldn't do. Well, I take it back. There's plenty of saying what they should or shouldn't do, but there's no one who's saying no. The RCMP has to uh, has to pull out. In fact, the Prime Minister of Canada, part of what what led to some of this stuff escalating the way it did, it was the, it was what Justin Trudeau said. Well, this is um, a provincial issue. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, the pipeline is within one province. But this abuse of Native people, this invasion of Native territory, that's not a provincial problem. That's, you know, that's an international problem. And, and, and the idea that, that Trudeau tries to pass the buck and say, well, the province, you know, this is, is a provincial deal. He made it sound like the, the federal government has no role. In fact, he got called out on this in, in, in the House of Commons. By, by the minister says, you can't say this, that the, the federal government has no rule or role in this thing. Especially when you consider the federal government is a part of pushing these pipelines. In fact, one of the pipelines, <laughs> the federal government took over the, the building of the pipeline because they felt like they were going to be in a stronger position to force their will through uh, against Native people. I mean, these pipelines are, are really private use highways for all intents and purpose, uh, purposes. This pipeline is so the, the oil, or in, in this case, the gas industry, can sell gas to, to, uh, to China. I mean, this isn't part of public infrastructure. So all these people claim, well, yeah, these pipelines are going to bring great jobs. No, they don't. You build a pipeline and then there's no jobs after that. You know, the, the, the guy who walks the pipeline every once in a while to make sure that uh, they haven't been vandalized or, the, or that they're not leaking. <laughs> I mean, that's that's not like massive or gainful employment. And building the pipelines, half the time they bring in their their own crews. They aren't hiring locals. Maybe a few token gestures that, that they'll make towards towards local employment. But these guys, these aren't permanent jobs; they're temporary jobs. So it's, I mean, it's it's all bullshit. I mean, there's no there's no other way to to characterize, you know, the crap that they're trying to sell with these pipelines. And of course, you know, they can make their argument that, that natural gas burns cleaner than coal or, or, or oil. But the problem is it may burn cleaner, but it still has a tremendous carbon footprint associated. It has greenhouse gas implications. And, and, and again, it's, it, it's a, it perpetuates the fossil fuel dependency. I mean, the reality is, you know, if Canada or the United States had any long-term vision they would stop trying to sell off their oil and gas to other countries and they would they would sit on those reserves for you know for their own purposes and prolong their ability to have access to it but no we would just sell it off make the money now just sell it all off and and sell it all off before you know before anybody really calls us out on the on the climate change crisis which it invariably still contributes to so i mean there, there's so much crap associated with this and and, and even even the, you know again back to this house of commons uh um, testimony and stuff like that when you hear these guys even the ones who sound very favorable or supportive to native issues they they still can't get past the idea that that we're not canadians and and or, or u.s citizens they can't get past that they they still want to make it sound like um, oh there's there's reconciliation that has to be done for the past, but they still won't address what the current I mean not just this current crisis over a pipeline, but they won't establish and, and and this is something even Justin Trudeau brought up. There's still a complete lack of clarity on what land title means. I mean the the this, the one woman um, 
Ms. May, I think her name was, she, I mean, she made it very clear that after the Wet'suwet'en won their case in Canadian Supreme Court over land title, of course they feel they have a right to stop a pipeline that goes through their territory. The, you know, the courts actually ruled on their side. So all this, this crap about rule of law, and again, this was pointed out by, by her and others, you can't suggest that Canada and the United States operate under rules of law if they completely ignore any of our pre-existing laws or, or, or customs or traditions. If you say, no, we're the, uh, you know, we're the colonial power, so we get to negate anything that you ever believed in because we're going to impose our laws, our rule of law, or <laughs> you know, law by rulers is what I call it. So, I mean, don't even, don't even hand me this rule of law crap. Because if there was, I mean, because let's understand what's legal. What's legal is to go in there and flood out hundreds or 100,000 acres of, of land of the Cree and Inuit to build, uh, to build hydroelectric dams. What's legal is to, uh, is to destroy land through and, and rip, out, or rip apart the boreal forest to, to do tar sands oil extraction. That's legal. What's legal was slavery. What's legal was, was paying bounties to, uh, for, for native scalps. All of that was legal. So don't give me your crap about rule of law. What was legal was, was to take kids out of native families and put them in residential schools where as high as 50% mortality rates existed. That was all legal. So don't give me your crap about rule of law. And, and that goes for you in the United States side too. So when, when we hear that, that these, these great nations of the world live and, and they operate and, and they, their culture is based and their societies are based on rule of law, no, it isn't. Because you change the laws. I mean, look, <laughs> rule of law as Trump pardons a bunch of criminals that are, that are his buddies. His buddy who was on his TV show. His buddy who um, um, helped screw this, the 2016 ele election. Or elections, his buddies, I should say. I mean, his his buddies that uh, you know that help 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 him build his wealth. Rule of law, really? There's no rule of law there. Oh yeah, it's a rule of law because the Constitution says the the president of the United States can pardon people. <laughs> yeah, so you can let criminals out. You know, white collar criminals, your criminals. Your criminal buddies, you can let them out, and you say because it's legal. That's like uh, I saw a movie the other day. It's called The Purge, where <laughs> where one day a year they say it's legal to kill people. Well, I gotta tell you, that may sound absurd. You know how many people were prosecuted for the uh, for the Tulsa massacres? None. You know how many people were were, were prosecuted for for lynchings? Oh, yeah, this one guy who dragged a native person behind his car in, in Texas, I think, just got uh, convicted. One. I mean, don't tell me about your rule of law. Because if rule of, if rule of law was really in place, we wouldn't have missing and murdered indigenous people. Women, children, men, boys. And on that note, <laughs> I got I to bring up one other point that connects these pipelines, these extractive industries, and their man camps. And if you don't know what a man camp is, Again, I've, I've talked about it on, on my, my show back, back here that I do, Let's Talk Native. But for those of you in New York who don't know what a man camp is, no, it's not the Boy Scouts. Well, of course, that's not such a good thing either. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, this isn't summer camp. Man camps are where when, people, when men leave their families wherever they, wherever they live, they leave their families and they go to these remote places where they where they are housed uh, and in these essentially these work camps, and they get paid, you know, real high wages, and they get to live away from their their wives and their and their children. And what happens in a man camp stays in a man camp. So what happens in these man camps? Well, there there's any number or any level of, uh, of, of moral turpitude that you could imagine exists. You know, the idea of trying to bring in prostitutes or, you know, these, these women and young girls who have been caught up in the sex slave trade. That's what happens in these man camps. These, these man camps are, are away from law enforcement 
In fact, they have no law enforcement. They're in such remote areas. There's no cops around. There's no village police. And there's no, you know, uh, uh, the RCMP don't exactly go there and police the, the main camps. They'll police the hell out of somebody blocking a pipeline, but they won't show up, uh, you know, when, when these man camps, you know, uh, uh, commit acts of violence against Native people, women in particular. So these man camps, which are the means by which these pipelines get produced. So, yeah, you want to talk about jobs? Not a lot of local jobs. They build man camps so they can bring, uh, bring these men from all over the United, United States and Canada, earn the big bucks for, or, you know, for a couple of years, and then go on off to, a, to another man camp someplace else to build, build the next pipeline. And all the while, women turn up missing. Not just missing temporarily, sometimes permanently missing, murdered. There's a direct connection between these man camps tied to pipelines and extractive industries and missing and murdered indigenous women. It's, this, isn't a, just a, uh, this isn't just a correlation. There's causation here. And again, this is an absolute failure to, uh, to recognize this. Uh, you know, by, I mean, I take it back. They recognize it in the Canadian government. They just don't do anything about it. What's the other thing that that is really, really prevalent about native territories? uh, Unsafe water. The boil water orders that exist in so many native territories are directly resulted uh, resulted from from Canadian or on the U.S. side, U.S. policy. The poverty that exists in these native territories. For one thing, you, you stripped away the sustainable lifestyles that Native people had. This is all part of that assimilation. And then you create crappy jobs that that nobody wants to do. And then you try to displace Native people by putting them in your cities and then wonder why why you end up having Native people occupy the the, the ghettos of of Canadian cities. It's it's a strategy. It's, It's a policy. It doesn't create it isn't created in a vacuum. Native people are not genetically predisposed to be poor. Just like white people aren't genetically predisposed to be rich. But if you look at the mean income, the average income of a native person versus the average income of a, of a non-native person, it's it, it's it's dramatic. And there and there's no way to to make any other explanation other than overt racism which never gets corrected. You know, so, so when, when, when there's an attempt to have any kind of conversation, what was Andrew Shear's first comments after, um, after he spoke in response to, uh, to Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada? He said that was the weakest response we've ever, you know, he talked about an abdication of his responsibility. Just because Justin Trudeau said, we need to, you know, we need to be patient. We, we need to address all of this stuff. This isn't just about a pipeline. It's not just about a blockade. It's about centuries of racism. Andrew Shears said it was, the, it was the weakest response he ever heard. Now, <laughs> I have problems with some of Justin Trudeau's response too, but not, in the, not for the same reason that Andrew Shear does. He has got the problem because he's, a, he's an overt racist. And he wants criminal prosecution. He wants physical action. He wants um, these people dragged off of these, uh, uh, not only dragged off of these blockades, but he wants them dragged out of any resistance. He said, what right do a few people have in standing in the way of Canadian progress and these, and these big Canadian projects? Well, how about the fact that, you're, that, you, that you are an illegal occupation, that you have no legal right to do these things? That's the reason, and 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 why is it only a few, a few people? Because you've been killing our people for for 150 years, Canada, for over 200 years, the United States, for over for half a millennium. When it comes to to European uh, the European invasion in the first place, you've been committing genocide for five freaking centuries against our people, including murder that that still continues today. So, yeah, are we in minority? Sure we are now. But when, but when you were committing some of these more egregious acts, and, and they're still pretty egregious, but your history is filled 
with you being able to commit murder legally against Native people. So if you're inconvenienced by a blockade, if your bread is coming to you too slow, if we're suggesting that you need to come up with other solutions than, than burning fossil fuels or transporting fossil fuels by rail or pipeline, we're not sorry for the inconvenience because your in inconvenience pales by comparison. All right, we're at the bottom of the hour. We'll take a break and we'll come back and I'll wrap this thing up. Uh, thanks for joining me and uh, we'll, we'll finish this thing up the next half hour to come right after this break. This is John Kane and this is Let's Talk. All right, thanks for coming back. I'm John Kane and this is Let's Talk. Uh, normally on WBAI FM 99.5 on the FM dial in New York City and normally streaming live at WBAI.org. But today, uh, I'm preempted from the uh, from WBI, but nothing's really going to hold me back if I really want to do a show. So here I am. I'm doing it on Facebook Live. Uh, the show will go out as a podcast afterwards, and um, we'll take the video of the show that we're streaming on Facebook Live, and we'll put it up on uh, on YouTube so people can. Uh, if you if you missed it or you're only catching a part of it, I realize that those of you trying to tune me in on the radio aren't getting me. Um, Although I might do a, a, a bit of an interview right afterwards on WBI because I, I think WBI does want to at least address the story. So maybe we'll, maybe I'll join uh, Paul DiRienzo after after I finish up this show. Um, but no, th so I, th I think this issue and the reason I wanted to do this show in spite of being preempted was not only to, to stay connected to those of you who especially who, who uh, watch or listen on uh, online. Um, this issue is is moving relatively quickly. I mean, we went from a 10 year standoff to um, a violent um, assault by uh, by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to a response from uh, you know, across Canada from Mohawks and other uh, native peoples um, blocking highways and uh, railways and border crossings and, and any number of uh, uh, of disruptions that that were have been taking place across um, uh, the Canadian side of Turtle Island um, to this again this kind of dramatic uh, testimony or, or, or speeches in the in the House of Commons, the Canadian House of Commons, a couple of days ago, to now this kind of pathetic, what you know, what the RCMP is calling an olive branch, this pathetic offer to, well, we'll pull the police out, but you got to let the uh, the workers back in. <laughs> no, this whole thing is about us not letting the workers in. I mean, and and again, and again, it's just one of those things that. Uh, it's almost hard for me to wrap my head around the logic or, or any anybody who would think that offering to, to remove the police. Look, I mean, don't get me wrong. When the police first went in there, they went in there with snipers. I'm not saying they sh they shot and killed people. But, but if you're there trying to defend your land and you see people in camo fatigues and, and, and paramilitary equipment and snipers setting up, drawing a bead on you, yeah, it's a little disarming. I mean, it's it, it's it's a little concerning. So yeah, I think it's great to pull the RCMP out, but to think that that your offer to pull the this this paramilitary police force out means that we should just let the pipeline go through? It's what the whole conflict is over, you morons. I mean, Jesus. Well, anyway, one of the things I didn't talk much about, although it didn't get it did get brought up um, during the, uh, the this House of Commons event was the reference to um, the UN Declaration on the Rights, Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Interestingly enough, and, I'm, and I talked about this on my show back here, uh, my Let's Talk Native show, but interestingly enough, in British Columbia, they actually put a law on the books. Uh, you know, they, they passed a measure to, to essentially codify or to incorporate the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples into British Columbia, Columbian law. So... This isn't just some arbitrary, um, unrelated or uh, unrecognized, you know, piece of literature. At least not in British Columbia. It's supposed to be part of their law. And in fact, Justin Trudeau made a commitment a number of years ago that that he would incorporate the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People into Canadian law. That he would he would he would fully adopt and support the provisions. Now, keep in mind. And and I and I always got to mention this. I mean, this thing is only what is it, forty-seven. I think forty-seven articles long. I mean, 
There are 46. There are 46 articles of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Article 43 says, The rights recognized herein constitute the minimum standard for survival, dignity, and well-being of the indigenous peoples of the world. So, to be clear, adopting this is the basic, most basic minimum standard. And, and so why did they even have a minimum standard? Because this, is, this was difficult to get the rest of the world to even adopt. And of course they did so with the four countries with significant indigenous populations, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, voting against it. Even though it's the minimum standard. And guess what, Canada? You don't meet it. Guess what, British Columbia? You can't meet, you're, you, you can't meet the minimum standards. Now, what, what is, there's a couple of basic things that the UN Declaration does. And it uses a phrase repeated over a half dozen times in the document called free, prior, and informed consent. Now, I've talked about this on my show, shows before, but the debate came out even as, as British Columbia was trying to codify this into British Columbian law, provincial law, the debate came out, well, wait a second. Does this mean that Native people have veto power over Canadian projects going through the land? Well, yeah, that's what free prior and informed consent means. It means that before you can do something that's going to impact the lands or people, and, and, it's, and again, it's, it's recharacterized a couple of times, not only as projects going forward, but even um, trying to uh, uh, create redress for actions of the past. It says, in order for, for there to be proper and legitimate um, permission going forward or redress looking backwards, you have to have free, prior, and informed consent from, from the indigenous people. So what does that mean? Well, I mean, it should be obvious, but perhaps it isn't, because obviously the Canadian lawmakers uh, had to debate whether this was tantamount to, to veto power. What it means is that you have, to, you have to get consent. So you have to get permission. Not only do you have to get permission, but that permission has to be clearly, uh, has to come clearly that, that it was given freely, that it was, that it was a consent that came freely. It wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't extorted consent <laughs> because that wouldn't really be consent. And it has to be consent that where the people were fully informed. So free, prior, and informed consent. It means before you can do the project, you have to get consent. See, that's, that's the other thing. <laughs> On the U.S. side, for instance, when they were building the Dakota Access Pipeline and even, and even the Keystone XL Pipeline, they just went and built it, came to the edge of where it would impact Native people, and then, then said, well, you know, uh, you can't stop us now. We built it already. <laughs> In fact, even on the United States side, when they were trying to do these environmental assessments, the, you know, these, these seeker forms or whatever they call them, these, these environmental impact studies, they, they wouldn't do an environmental impact study on an entire pipeline. They said, well, if we do 10 miles here, there's not significant impact. Well, well and if we do another 10 miles, it's not significant environmental impact. And, and so they could use the word significant by, by cutting it up into sections and say, well, we don't, we're not committing any seriously envi serious environmental impact. Yes, because you're not looking at the whole pipeline, which is kind of what they do on the Canadian side as well. I mean, they build this pipeline right to the edge of, of <laughs> what's always in territory. And they say, well, we, we can't change now. We can't reroute it now. Yeah, you can. You can tear that pipe, pipe out of the ground anytime you want. But you're not going to put more, more pipeline through here. So, I mean, so the, again, this whole debate about what free prior to informed consent means, what it means is that U.S. and Canada, you refuse to meet the minimum standard that the rest of the world agreed to. And frankly, that you've agreed to. Yes, you, Justin Trudeau, you're the one who said you were going to adopt this, fully adopt the, um, uh, the intent the aspirations, I, I guess that's a way of, of manipulating the language, I guess. We fully intend to um, adopt the aspirations of the agreement. So what? What does that mean? Aspirations. You know, aspiration has to do with breathing, like the air around it. So, yeah, the, the air, I mean, we're going to adopt the air around the agreement, but we're not going to adopt the, 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 the specific... I mean, the specific intent, or, or we're only going to adopt what this agreement aspires to do, what it, what it wants to do. We're not going to do it, but we'll adopt some of the 
some of the things that it aspires to do. Give me a freaking break. If you can't understand the concept of free prior and informed consent, and, and again, I got to mention it, it, six times it shows up in this agreement. It's not just snuck in on some, uh, some arbitrary or obscure uh, article in, in this thing. It is, it's mentioned six freaking times. It, six different ways it is telling the, these colonial powers the minimum standard, the minimum standard is free prior and informed consent. Now, there are many of us as Native people, we reject the idea that, the, that this minimum standard is enough. Because what's missing in here is, is any notion or any semblance of, of sovereignty or free independent existence. I mean, there's a, the word free and freedom is in here a bunch of times, but not as a free and distinct people. That's not in here. It, you know, it talks about maintaining some levels of distinction, you know, but, but, it, but it's really about still incorporating us. In fact, the, the problem that I have, even with the word indigenous, and of course I got it on my hat here as well, but the, the international definition of indigenous, what's implied in their definition is that we are the descendants of a people who preexisted these colonial powers. No, we're not the descendants. We are those people. We are still those people. And you know what? In a hundred years, when your economies collapse, we will still be those people. So uh, look, I'll use the word indigenous, but don't for a second interpret that, that uh, my usage of it, that I'm merely a descendant of a people. You know who are the descendants of those people? <laughs> I, guess, I, I guess this is part of the issue. The ones who are the descendants of these people are the ones who are now Canadians, and just happen to have brown skin. The ones who are now U.S. citizens that now have uh, that have brown skin that look like they're native people, but they aren't. No, they aren't. They're they're U.S. citizens and they're Canadian citizens. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, I'll tell you. Here's the significance. Again, you remember that free prior and informed consent thing? Well, here's the problem with that. Canada and the United States they want to be the ones who who can determine. Who has the authority to give that consent? So while well, you get Andrew Shearer saying, oh, it's nothing but a bunch of radical, radicals out there stopping, uh, stopping the tracks. They don't have any say. Yeah. So according to Andrew Shearer, you don't need to get consent from those people. You, you only need to get consent from what? Band council chiefs? Chiefs that, that whose authority comes from the Indian Act, from a, a Canadian law? Or from, from federal recognition as a tribe, band, or nation of Indians subordinate to the laws of the United States? I'm sorry. If, if your authority comes from Canada and the United States out of their structures, then you can't give consent. The consent has to come from the people. Not from Canadian appointed officials or U.S. Appoint, or Canadian or, or U.S. appointed or recognized officials. I mean, because you, you have to understand. I mean, I, I know some people are going to say, well, yeah, but if they're duly elected, yeah. Who makes the elections? Who, who, who constructs the election? Canada and the United States. They get to decide whether an election is valid or not. And what do they need? What, do they need um, a majority of people to participate in the election? No. You know, you know what the standard is in, uh, in, on the United States for a legitimate tribal election? The majority of 30%. So they only need to have, and of course they don't even they don't even really enforce this. For the Bureau of Indian Affairs to recognize a quote unquote tribal election or or, or a process, I mean it doesn't even have to be an election. It could be a you know some sort of write-in, you know, petition. They only need 30% participation based on the numbers that they have. And of course, the federal government gets to determine, you know, they they so somebody can submit, well, this is what our population is. And we had 30% per, uh, participation of the adults. And um, we, you know, so the majority, or not even the majority, it's not even the majority, because if you have three ca candidates running for a, a, just the largest minority. So you essentially can be elevated to the powers afforded to you by the Canadian government or the, or the federal, U.S. federal government by just a shadow of, of, the, of the consent of the people. No, no, no real consent. 
I mean, this is the the ridiculousness associated with with American and U.S. Uh, and Canadian style um, elections. I mean, they're essentially fraud. They they. I mean, if you don't have enough pop, if if you don't have enough people participating, then you have essentially been granted a vote of no confidence. If you can only get thirty percent of your population to participate in the election, that means that they don't support the the they don't support the process. So so how do you determine consensus? Well, you sure as hell aren't gonna aren't gonna get it from an Indian Act chief. And and frankly, even the so called traditionals or hereditary chiefs, they they don't have the authority to go against the will of their people. A unique concept that at least existed amongst the the Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee, but across much of Turtle Island, was the people that you that you give a responsibility to are the servants of the people. So those people that that are now called chiefs, and that's not one of our words, by the way, or tribal chairman, <laughs> or president. Or grand chief? I mean, where the hell does this one come from? Every one of these uh, these 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 band councils, they not only have their their chiefs, but they have the grand chief, which that in of itself is a violation of our culture. The idea that one chief is more grand than the other. No, they don't have the authority. Even within our traditional systems, the the, the Guyana or Goa, no individuals have power over other individuals we all have power and so that's why we have a system of of reaching consensus one that we all agree upon even if we don't necessarily like the idea we create a process to 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 determine consensus so how do you have consent if you don't have consensus you don't you just, you just find some token native guy that you can have put an x on a piece of paper a an, an indian act chief you know, Perry Bellegarde or Mike Mitchell. I mean, this this one guy from uh, from Ganazadage, he literally got locked out of his own tribal council office. Simon is his last name. He got locked out. Of, he he literally got locked out of uh, out of his out of his chief's office because he he went on the record saying that the the blockade should end. And so, what do you do today? Today, you apologize. Uh, you know, I got. I'm, I'm sorry. He goes. I, I guess I should. I should have spoken without really consulting. I was just trying to have the best interest of my people in mind. Well, if you're if your people are supporting the blockades, you can't go out there and speak out against them. You know what happens when you do that? <laughs> they lock you out of your office and you get thrown out on your ass. Well, they didn't permanently remove him, but he had to. He had to tuck his tail squarely between his legs and come in hat in hand and beg for forgiveness. Well, at least I'll give them that. Half the time, these arrogant band counselors believe because it can't, because Canada recognizes their authority. And I say recognizes. Let's be clear. It's not about recognizing their, their authority. They give them the authority because they don't have it from their own people. So here's the, the and there lies the problem with, with free prior and informed consent. Consent from who? In fact, there's another problem with the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is when the, when the U.S. and Canadian governments want to say, well, we can determine who is and isn't an indigenous people. You, you know, they get to say, well, you know, you, in fact, this is a big problem on the Canadian side. You have massive amounts of women in particular who get taken off of their, their band council roles based on marrying out or blood quantum or whatever else, not based on whether they're really a part of a community. It's, it's like the people don't get to decide. Canada decides. I mean, this is in, in many ways where much of the policies on the Canadian side are even worse than on the U.S. side. Again, having to address this myth that it's all nice in Canada. You know what's nice in Canada? The level of pristine land that still exists there. But it's under a constant threat. I mean, everybody's real quick to say, well, you know, what that Bolsonaro is doing in, uh, in uh, Brazil is terrible. <laughs> well, you know, you, you can go right on Google Maps and zoom in on the tar sands uh, uh, oil fields in, in Alberta. 
You think what, what Bolsonaro is doing? Why, why is anybody concerned about what Bolsonaro is doing? You know why? Because, because people in the rest of the world are concerned about his, the impact that, is, that there will be on global warming if the rainforest uh, is, is gobbled up and, and slashed and burned and developed for beef cattle or whatever else. It's because they're concerned about their impact. They don't give a rat's ass about what's happening to, to the people in, in Brazil. It's not about them. Same, and that's why they can ignore what's happening on the Canadian side. The fact that, that, that oil executives and, and Canadian politicians are selling out the land, are digging deep into, into our mother to, to extract oil or gas or minerals or, or gems or whatever else, and destroying the land. No, the rest of the world doesn't care. They don't care. I mean, if you saw, you know, among the largest dams in North America are the earthen dams. These are just dirt dams that were built to, to contain settling ponds for the extraction of oil, tar sand oil from the sands. These, these huge black oil-topped lakes in Alberta that exist solely for the, the separation of, 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 of oil and water. You know what happens when a bird lands on that? They're dead. Nobody's going to go fish out, you know, some poor goose or seagull or heron or eagle. Nobody's going to fish them out of there. Who the hell is going to want to go out in a, in a, a oil-soaked lake to, to fish out a bird that's probably going to die anyway once it's gotten soaked? Look, there's, there's no way to paint a full picture. Not with a one-hour show, not with a two-hour show, not with a series of shows. But I do wish that you, you at least will come join us next week when, when Regan and I um, not only do our show live in, uh, in the WBI studios, but we, when we um, uh, feature and, and screen the, uh, the film Invasion. You'll get a sense when we, when we talk about Invasion, what it really is. And, and perhaps we'll even, you know, we'll bring some other video along the way so you can get a better sense for, for how this story is developing. And, and, and I can't impress upon people enough. This isn't a Canadian issue. This is a global issue. I mean, the, those, it's my, some of these are my family members. These are, these are people I'm related to that are doing the blockades. And as far as I'm concerned, the, the people in, in, in Wet'suwet'en territory are my relatives too. We, we call ourselves Ungwe Ungwe. And it means we're connected to the land. We all are connected to this land. So even though I may identify as Gunyakahag or Mohawk, or somebody else may identify as Métis or you know, uh, Anishinaabe or Ojibwe or whatever else, we're all related. Even though we have some distinctions about our culture, that we've managed to maintain in spite, in spite of 500 years of forced assimilation, 500 years of genocide. We still, we still maintain some level of distinction. That's why you listen to Let's Talk, so you can hear a perspective you haven't heard before. I want to thank you for listening uh, today. I want to thank you for... Uh, uh, for tuning us in, even though we weren't on the FM dial. And I look forward to being back in the studio next week. I'm John Kane, and this is Let's Talk. Yahweh.